The Israel-Hamas war has claimed more than 1,300 lives so far. The world's reaction has been one of shock. But why did it take so long for New Zealand's foreign minister to condemn the Hamas terror attack on Israel? The Labour leader, Chris Hipkins, joins us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Before we get to that issue... Would New Zealand ever provide some sort of military aid to Israel? Um, we always um, try and make our contributions to these sorts of conflicts in a multilateral way. So we, we work with other like-minded partners to identify how best New Zealand can support efforts. So that's a no to any military aid? Um, well, we, we've offered military aid in, um, limited, in a limited range of circumstances. It's a big decision to take. Um, we're offering uh, military aid, for example, to Ukraine, but not in the form of direct participation in the conflict. We're offering that support in terms of troop training. You know, we're training their troops. Um, we, have offer, we have had boots on the ground in places like Afghanistan, um, and we've contributed to peacekeeping efforts in other parts of the world. Um, I think it's still too early to even really speculate on what a, a New Zealand contribution here might look like. Has there been a request at all? Uh, as I've indicated, I think we would look to make sure that we're supporting any multilateral, you know, international efforts. Have there been multilateral requests for our assistance? Not yet, but there's certainly conversations happening. Between? Oh, between... Uh, but there was a United Nations Security Council meeting. No particular um, outcome came from that meeting, but there will, will undoubtedly be international conversations. Do you support the complete siege of Gaza, cutting off food, fuel, water and electricity? You've said that Israel has the right to defend itself. Do you support that right? Well, is Israel has a right to defend itself, but there are international norms in terms of what a proportionate response is, and we would expect that, there, that they continue to comply with Is that, that proportionate? Um, look, I'm, I'm not going to make a judgment on specifics what's at this point. New, at this New point, I don't, think, I don't think I'm in a position to be able to do that in an informed way. What's the New Zealand government's position on a siege of food, fuel, water and electricity on the Palestinians living in Gaza? Our, our, our position remains that New Zealand supports a two-state solution when it comes to um, the situation there. Um, in terms of the specific conflict, I'm not going to take a position on a day-by-day -day basis about you know whether Israel's justified in its actions or not. I simply don't have enough information about what is happening on the ground there right now to be able to do that. And I don't think it would be a responsible thing for New Zealand to do. Is what Hamas did in taking those hostages and slaughtering those people at the music festival an act of terror? Uh, it is utterly unacceptable. And um, Israel is right to do, has a right to defend itself, and New Zealand has absolutely condemned the actions of Hamas. How can you see it as anything other than a terror attack? Um, look, it, it's certainly a, a terrorist-like attack, yeah. Whether it's, whether it's classified under international law as a terrorist attack, it's certainly unacceptable. Hamas is a terrorist entity, according we, to our government. We recognise them as a terrorist entity, yes. We, we recognise the military wing of Hamas yes. as a terrorist entity. I have asked for more advice to be prepared on whether that go, should go further um, to the political wing of Hamas as well. Now, that advice will come through, um, and ultimately that will be a decision for post-election rather than pre-election, but uh, it is something that I've asked for officials to give um, advice to the government on. Given that... You have, as the Labour Party, just a week ago, released a policy where you invite Palestine's Canberra-based representative to provide his credentials to New Zealand in order that he might become an official ambassador here. Is that still your policy? Um, look, it's certainly not something that we're going to be progressing quickly, given in light of current circumstances. New Zealand's position, and the Labour Party's position, is that we support a two-state solution, and that does involve diplomatic dialogue on both sides, with Israel and with Palestine. Um, I think clearly this uh, has changed the dynamic a little bit, um, and it's not something that I would envisage us progressing quickly. Are you scrapping the policy? No, I'm not scrapping it. Are but you I'm saying, pausing uh, But I, I would say, I would go so far as to say that I'd pause it in light of it recent developments. Okay. Why was it that Nanaia Mahuta, your foreign minister, took seven hours to follow up on a tweet that she sent on behalf of the New Zealand government with our response in which she said that they were, quote, concerned about the outbreak of violence between Israel and Gaza and calling for an end to the violence and protect protecting civilians. That was at 7.39am on October the 8th. Why did it take seven hours for that statement to be hardened up? Well, I think Nanai Mahuta herself said yesterday that her response could have been, you know, could, she could have used stronger language in her initial response. I used very strong language in my initial response and I absolutely stand by that. Why didn't she? Uh, you know, ultimately, her, her, I think people are judging based on a tweet. I, I gave a press conference in which I set out the New Zealand response. I mean, it was a very strong one.
But the first initial response from the New Zealand government came from Nanai Mahuta, and by your own admission, it was too weak. Why was that? Um, uh, look, Nanaya worked based on you know, advice that she was provided. I think her response could have been stronger. I think she, in retrospect, thinks her response could have been stronger. I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over that, though. I set out a very strong position uh, reflecting New Zealand's stance, our condemna condemnation of the attack, and our support for Israel and their right to defend themselves. Penny Wong, who's the Australian Foreign Minister, in a tweet before Nanaya Mahuta's, said Australia unequivocally condemns attacks on Israel by Hamas we call on attacks to stop and we recognise Israel's fight right to defend themselves. What information did Penny Wong have available to her that Nanai didn't? And, and I had a conversation with Prime Minister Albanese, uh, myself directly, where um, we had a, a good conversation about the conflict. I think New Zealand's and Australia's positions are absolutely in lockstep. But they weren't to begin with. So what information did Penny Wong have that Nanai didn't? Well, I think the fact that a tweet wasn't as strongly worded as it might mean doesn't mean anything. It does not mean that there was a weaker New Zealand position. Um, it, in my position, I set it out very clearly. The New Zealand government's position was set out very clearly at the first available opportunity, the first time I was in front of a bank of TV cameras. Yeah. Is the, is the reason that Nanaya started off with, by your admission, a weaker statement because she has been pushing for Palestine to be recognised? No, not at all. She's not. So you two are in complete lockstep with your view on this conflict. Absolutely, I had a conversation with her. I don't think there's any difference, but in, in our opinions. What do you make of Sunny Bill Williams, who's copping some flack for supporting a tweet calling Hamas freedom fighters and comparing them to Ukrainians fighters? As the Prime Minister, how does the government view that? Um, uh, that's, I'm not going to comment on every individual tweet or action of every individual New Zealander. Um, that does not reflect New Zealand's position. Uh, this is a, a, an unjustified act of aggression. Um, we absolutely you can dim it. You have been um, for a couple of days now banging on about the coalition of chaos on the right. What does a coalition on the left look like? Particularly if you're talking about Te Pāti Māori. We've reached out to Te Pāti Māori to ask them for their bottom lines in potential negotiations with you. And they say it would be extremely unlikely they would enter into coalition with you without fixing the tax system first. They say ending poverty is their bottom line and a wealth tax is one of their primary policies. So would you entertain it? I'm confident that based on our past working relationship with the Green Party that we'd have a very strong relationship with them. And I'm confident based on the Māori Party's track record, they were spent nine years supporting a John Key-led national government, um, that actually they will be responsible in supporting government as well. The contrast of National Act and New Zealand First is there for all to see. David Seymour yesterday was basically saying that he was going to hold the country to ransom on yeah. a day-by-day -day basis yeah, for three your, years. Yeah, but let's talk about you guys. It's extremely unlikely they would enter into a coalition with you without fixing the tax system first. So you're still ruling out... As well, there are any, if you there, were, there are if any you number of governing arrangements. There's coalition arrangements, there's confidence and supply arrangements. Okay. And depending on the level of agreement that you can reach, there could, either of those could be on the table. But, as, but yeah, none you, of them are threatening another election, which no, is what National are threatening. But you would never do a wealth tax as, as PM. Absolutely. You're sticking by that, clear that wholeheartedly. Would you serve in a cabinet that you didn't lead that might go with a wealth tax? Um, look, that's not an option that's on the table. All right, let's talk about the Port Waikato and Neil Christensen obviously sadly has passed away. Do you have a date yet for a by-election? Um, I have to um, make the decision on that today. Um, I will consult with the Leader of the Opposition um, because obviously the by-election will happen after the election, although we have to initiate the process for that today. How long, how long does it take to, to gear up for one? Like, what, How soon could we expect one roughly after the election? That, that's the advice that I have, have been getting, so you know, how quickly can it be done? It can be done within probably a month or so of the general election result, um, probably not any faster than that. Um, so there will be. So we'll set that out um, this afternoon. This could give the Nats an extra MP, which would make their life a whole lot easier. Uh, and maybe no, they wouldn't even need. No, I, th I mean people who are making that claim don't necessarily understand the formula that sits behind MMP because it very much depends on who gets the last list spot, um, and that can that can change based on special vote count. So um, I, you can't necessarily draw that conclusion. Let's talk very quickly about petrol. Um, already we've seen um, Brent crude up $4 a barrel overnight. That's 5% on the news of the war uh, with Israel and Hamas. 
Are you completely ruling out changes to your petrol policies, that's both the increase to the excise and refusing to do what National is doing and getting rid of the Auckland Regional Fuel Tax? You won't look at any changes to petrol policies, even if this potentially pushes prices up further into Christmas. So let's be clear about National's removal of the Regional Fuel Tax. Aucklanders are still going to pay. They're going to end up paying on their rates I get that. rather than on their, their petrol bills. I get that, but They're going to also introduce a congestion charge, which they will pay that as well. So I think National's being disingenuous here. They are actually going to continue to raise the same amount of money. They're just going to raise it a different way. Aucklanders will still pay. And in fact, this is typical National Party smoke and mirrors. Yeah, yeah. I think when, National, when people look at, the, at what the National Party are proposing, if they win, they're going to lose. Because National continue to give with one hand, but then they take more okay, back with what, the other. Oh, fair enough. But what I'm asking you this morning for our, for our viewers is if the price of petrol keeps climbing and climbing in the way experts are worried that it will, is Labor going to help them with their cost of petrol? When is it? At what price is it? Too I don't much? have any current plans to um, reduce petrol tax, but of course you can't always, you know, crystal ball gaze into the future and say never say never on things. Um, but at the moment, but that is a very, that was a very expensive commitment that we made to keep uh, fuel prices lower. It certainly was. Um, Chris Hipkins, thank you very much for coming in this morning. This might be our last time talking. No, absolutely not. <laughs> well, with you as I'm, Prime Minister. Anyway. Oh, well, I, I, no, I, look, I'll tell you what, I think the election's going to be a lot closer than people are anticipating. The National Party's polling numbers have been coming down week on week um, since the campaign began. Uh, and let's, re, let's not forget, your latest, your News Hub poll before the last election had National five and a half points higher than what they got on Election Day and Labour four points lower than what they got on Election Day. A lot can happen in the last few days of an election campaign. Chris Hipkins, thank you very much for coming in. Labour leader and Prime Minister Chris Hipkins, it's just gone half past eight.